Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you're joining us for this morning's presentation of the 2019 Community Health Assessment Reports. We hope that you are going to learn what's new and what it can mean for you. The Community Health Assessment, or CHA, are produced through the work of the Community Health Assessment Network. CHAN is comprised of representatives across the province including the Department of Health Seniors and Active Living, the Department of Education, including Healthy Child Manitoba, the Manitoba Center for Health Policy at the University of Manitoba, the George and Fayy Center for Healthcare Innovation, Shared Health, along with all of the service delivery organizations throughout Manitoba as listed here before you. We are very fortunate here in Manitoba to have this uh, dedicated group of decision support uh, analysts and um, people that can do this kind of data sy synthesis work um, because this really has helped us uh, to provide input into local and provincial health planning. For this uh, presentation, we had three presenters. Uh, myself, I'm Alice Morga. I'm the Regional Director for Planning and Evaluation in Southern Health Santé Sud. Um, as well, we had Dr. Yang Sui from the Center for Healthcare Innovation and Heather Sparling from Manitoba Health uh, Seniors and Active Living. The three of us put this presentation together, but for this narration, you are uh, just going to be hearing from myself. And all three of us have been involved in the CHA uh, process for uh, one or more cycles. And Heather has uh, been involved for probably the past uh, two decades. So she has a lot of experience. So improving population health is an urgent manner. Great gains have been made over the last hundred years in terms of life expectancy, and yet health inequalities and inequities have been widened in many countries and certainly in parts of Manitoba. In most places, attempts to achieve better population health and well-being fall short because of efforts uh, tend to not focus on addressing the root causes, and those are the determinants of health and the reduction of health disparities. There is ample evidence of successful population health processes, both in terms of improving outcomes and cost effectiveness, and although the benefits may take years to materialize. For population health approaches to work effectively, we know, they must take into account local context and have a clear understanding of what the local strengths and assets, pressures and needs are. This requires access to good quality uh, joined up information to understand the population and the areas of greatest need and vulnerability so this can inform policy, service design and delivery. It also requires active involvement and resourcing of local authorities to tailor initiatives according to their local strengths and goals. CHA is basically that recipe for good quality joined up information. The CHA reports provide information down to the smallest of geographies that we are able to do on the social determinants such as housing, education, employment, and social connectedness, all of which together have been shown to have a greater impact on health and well-being compared to health and health services just on their own. The CHAs also identify strengths and gaps, challenges, and opportunities. This next slide uh, basically explains uh, what the agenda of this presentation is covering today. We hope that at the end of our presentation, you will have a sense of what you will find uh, if you look into a CHA report and understand some of the changes that have been made to these reports that differentiate from previous cycles. You should also get a sense of how the reports are currently being used and how to understand the data, which is presented in a very different way. And then we are going to also look within the regions uh, to get a closer look in terms of uh, some of the key findings and the narrative sections that provide local context. And lastly, some key provincial findings will be shared 
and we'll look at what's next for CHA as far as is known. So the community health assessment was designed to provide population health and health system utilization data often down to this district level for local planning at the, since uh, the time of regionalization way back in the late 1990s. As this process matured, it was tied into the strategic planning process of the regional health authorities, which were produced every five years and providing data to identify uh, some of those priorities. Most recently, it has focused on health at inequity as a framing concept for the CHA reports. The CHA uh, in 2019 rep uh, represents the culmination of the fifth cycle of CHA in Manitoba. And certainly each cycle has had major events that have impacted the process. Considering the number and impact of changes on the healthcare system since regionalization, it is quite an important historical feat that the CHA process has been maintained throughout. This longevity supports trend analysis as well as capacity building in our province. We found that learning by doing sticks more than learning by reading. For the 2019 CHA, Chan enabled a coordinated approach to province-wide comparability on health issues within the health regions while recognizing and respecting the diversity among them. So all of the CHA reports were released at the same time. This was the first time that we've ever done this and the response was very strong. Even though these reports were released right before the holiday season, they drew a lot of attention from major media outlets. We found this was very successful. And all of the reports have been posted on each uh, RHA website. However, you can also go to Shared Health under the quality learning framework as you can see me pointing here and then uh, find them find all the links right here so first you might be wondering what is the CHA well basically these are comprehensive reports which use a population health perspective the population health approach is aimed to improve the health of the entire population and to reduce inequities among population groups. The CHA is also a tool uh, for health planning, helping us to identify a community's strengths and needs to guide priorities that will improve the population's health status over time. And here is what we use to organize the reports. This is a framework that was used and adapted from a citizen's guide to health indicators, which was developed by the Canadian Institute for Health Information, CAIHI. And this provides a common lens in which to articulate the population health and health system characteristics. In this fifth cycle of our CHA, we have 133 indicators that were reported on, and these were divided into four domains. Measuring health equity is central to this report, as is indicated by its central location within the domains. With categories measuring health status, social determinants of health, community and health system characteristics, and health system performance. As a provincial clinical and preventative services plan guides and supports decisions about human resources, investments, and clinical services, the valuable information we have gathered in the CHAs will help to ensure those clinical experts have a real understanding of our populations. This next slide shows the relationship of CHA to some of the other fantastic reports we have in our province. So all reports have been developed somewhat independently, um, but have come and have come from different perspectives on what to focus on in terms of health. But the advantage is that these have all been pulled together, taken together, and they can build a comprehensive picture for all of us. The clinical and preventative health services report doubles down on building efficiencies and healthcare service deliveries. The MCHP reports take a broader population health perspective with a focus on health status and health system utilization. And then the recently released health status and access uh, to health care by registered First Nations people in Manitoba focuses on indicators specifically related to First Nations people in Manitoba.
So what the CHA report does is bridge all of this information together in both health system performance, health status, and health determinants. We also have additional indicators that are not included in some of these reports, such as body mass index, um, cancer and cancer screening, some sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections like syphilis, early development instrument, and family's first risk factors. The audience of the CHA isn't just health, but it can help to equip the key stakeholders of the healthcare system and help monitor what is in the clinical and preventative services plan. The CHA is also aligned with the Manitoba Quality and Learning Framework. This framework and the data presented in the CHA can be used together to support a culture of continuous improvement and learning while helping all levels of the health system with priority setting, strategic and operational planning, clinical and preventative services planning and implementation, the development of meaningful quality performance measures, policies and guidelines. These common goals also ensure that we are able to closely monitor progress and success by aligning the indicators included in the community health assessment with the overarching goals of the health system. Regional health authorities will be able to use this data and the framework together to set priorities and monitor quality performance all within a culture of continuous improvement and learning. To answer the question, what's new in this report, I have to say lots, lots, lots. Previous reports all presented on the same core set of indicators, but the order and the style of each report was unique to the region. The what was the same, but the how looked very different. This time around, the how is the same. All regions have worked very hard together with many compromises and concessions to develop a common provincial template. This has really facilitated that provincial level of analysis. Instead of contracting the CHA process out to an external provider, each region completed their own CHA report. And as such, this has really helped to build capacity within each region because staff are able to assist with knowledge translation and interpreting the findings. A new Made in Manitoba way to present the data was developed and we think it's phenomenal. It really showcases regional gaps and variations. Previous reports presented data by income quintiles, but then now these reports present both income disparity and geographic disparity. We also have new indicators that have been added to fill in the gaps. And as mentioned earlier, that regional context is now provided through these story boxes called a closer look. As noted, new survey indicators were added. We capitalized on the Canadian Community Health Survey data, which was produced through information management and analytics, particularly on a provincial CCHS report from fall of 2018. And this showed how the data might be presented. And so 16 new indicators were chosen. <coughs> As well, we used information from the Canadian Patient Experience Survey that was presented in 2018. This was the first year that all five regions used the same survey in Manitoba. So there were five new quality of care indicators that were used based on a patient's recent hospital stay experience. We also used information from the census, which was not available in the fourth cycle of our CHAs. So we held off until we could include this data from the 2016 census. And in addition, there were 10 new indicators that were added. We also have new information from the Health Administrative Data Repository, including kidney disease indicators, childhood immunization, syphilis rates, nurse practitioner, and late stage cancer diagnosis from Cancer Care Manitoba. So there is a lot more in these reports. The CHA report informs health services planning at all levels, from a community organization to a service delivery organization to shared health and to the Manitoba government. This can integrate population. We can also in integrate population health data into Manitoba's clinical and preventative services plan to support evaluation and ensure the clinical experts have a real understanding of our population health needs and the burden of illness.
This will also help them determine priority areas to address gaps in services and help develop disease and injury prevention and health promotion. The CHA can also be helpful to inform the, Canadian, uh, the Chief's Public Health Officer's report. So rather than duplicating reporting, this can build on information that we have learned from the CHA process. Community engagement. This is an essential agreement of the community health assessment, and it's about collaborative participation. So community engagement in a region is important to ensure diverse voices and perspectives are included. For example, we engage and consult with community organizations in many areas of each region throughout the province. And currently we are producing community profiles in order to make sure that the information is useful and meaningful at that community level. This information can be used for various purposes, including programs and services planning and grant funding opportunities. In Winnipeg, primary care physicians used the CHA to help plan services. For example, the primary care team at the Northern Connection Medical Centre plan to spend a half day reviewing the CHA report and determining how it impacts their strategic priorities as primary health care providers. And this is just one example of many. As well in Winnipeg, um, they will be using the community area profile consultation sessions with each community area to inform the participants who are from different organizations about PROMs and PREMs, uh, which will, in order to increase awareness of these surveys. So for the CHA moving forward, it can be integrated into community and public en engagement processes, and the results of these two surveys can be presented in future CHA reports. So what kind of information can you find in each of these reports? First, you will have an introduction and four chapters. In the introduction, this includes information about the CHA in Manitoba, as well as a section on health equity and information on all the data sources and limitations. As well, we consulted with representatives who produced the First Nations Atlas report that was released just a few months prior to the CHA reports uh, last fall, and we wanted to honour this work and respect the wishes of our First Nation partners. So what was decided in the end was to make reference to this report as a whole rather than pulling out data into separate regional CHA reports. So there is a section within the introduction which describes this report, offers some high-level key findings, and then as well as a reference to this um, report and where you can find it. This entire introduction section is consistent across all CHA reports because we collaborated on it provincially. In chapter, fun, uh, chapter one, uh, this outlines the geography of each region, all five regions uh, in Manitoba, as well as demographic features of each population. So this will be unique to each CHA report, and this is where you will also find the unique characteristics of various populations based on where they live in Manitoba, which is really essential for planning purposes. In chapter two, looks at what keeps us healthy. Here we present information regarding the social determinants of health, such as income levels, unemployment, housing affordability, as well as indicators around personal health determinants and behaviors and use of preventative services. Chapter three is a large chapter, as you can imagine, because it includes so many important indicators around how healthy is the population. So basically around the health status of a population. And here you will find indicators around mortality, but also across many chronic disease rates in Manitoba, as well as uh, sexually transmitted infections. Then chapter four looks at health service utilization of residents within each service delivery organization. This includes indicators and uses of primary health care, home care, and personal care homes. This next slide shows that the vast majority of indicators in the report have a similar format and content to allow for easier navigation. It is now more consistent than ever before. Here, it is, here is an example of what you will find. First, each indicator includes a definition. This is a simple definition and not too technical because we know that CHA reports have many, many users. 
And then there's a little bit about what, what makes that indicator important. Again, a user-friendly explanation about that indicator and helpful for any person uh, reading the reports. Then we include a breakdown of provincial key findings followed by regional key findings. So the top three things, the definition, why it's important, and provincial key findings will look similar throughout all of the CHA reports, no matter which one you pick up, but the regional key findings would be specific to each service delivery organization. As you can imagine, this was a very intense process with many revisions and consultations when we weren't sure, um, but we are very happy with the end result and hope that this helps users not only within the healthcare system, but across it as well. As mentioned earlier, we have a swanky new way to present graphs. This slide shows how the graphs used to be presented in bar charts, in a vertical way over two time periods. There's absolutely nothing wrong with these charts. Uh, we have grown to love them over the years, but right now we're in this period of transition with health system transformation activities really ramping up, and we felt that this was an opportunity to revamp these graphs and provide a further level of detail. So ta-da, this is what you'll actually see in a CHA report. It's very different, I know. Sometimes we look, we call these sliding scales. We're not sure if this is a technical definition, but that's what we're calling it here in Manitoba. But basically going from this vertical to a horizontal in two bars now with a little bit more pizzazz. I'm just going to t quickly walk you through these. First, you will notice that every region is represented by a unique color. We are able to do this because we're really taking advantage of the digital age and we're not limited anymore by printing costs. Now that all the reports are available online, we aren't as worried about uh, the color and so we've really tried to take advantage of that. So these are the five colors that each service delivery organization chose for themselves and they will be the same and consistent throughout each report. And Manitoba is represented in black. Those top two bars tell you two things. Data from two time periods with the most recent on top for time two and the previous in the bottom or the older period. As well, you will find the dates for each time period in the title of the figure, if you're ever unsure. As well, the bars represent the range in values from the lowest here in Southern Health to the highest in Northern uh, health region. They will be different for each indicator. So in some, Northern might have the lowest rate. It will just depend on what is being measured, but you can quickly see how wide that range is with most regions clustered together in this example and Northern way off to the right side. This shows that there is a wide range in values for premature deaths. Also, by stacking the two time periods in this way, it provides a quick visualization of whether a rate has increased or decreased over time. And in this case, we can see that over time, premature deaths have improved. There's also a table below these figures which provides further level of details. Here you can find the actual rates, which you would not get from looking at the sliding scales above, as well as crude counts. This is something new to CHA reports. So for example, in the Mani for Manitoba, the rate was 2.98 for the most current time period, and this represents almost 20,000 premature deaths. This information is also provided for each service delivery organization for your reference. You will also notice in uh, these sliding scales and in the tables, these small L's and H's, and these represent significance tests. When you see an L, this means that the value is significantly lower than the provincial average, whereas an H means that the value is significantly higher than the provincial average. So as I mentioned, these scale sliding scales not only take up uh, a little bit of less space, we think they're pretty cool, but they also give us more detail than we've ever had before. The data in the reports is also broken down into smaller geographies as shown here before you. Instead of graphs, however, we use tables for, um, for this information. This is an example for Southern and you could still, um, and what it shows is that you could still have the, the provincial rates and the regional rates are shown in these data tables, but it is also further broken down by geography. 
The first level is called zones for all of the rural regions and community areas for Winnipeg. We have in Southern four zones, but this might be different uh, for each service delivery organization. And then within zones, it is bro further broken down into smaller geographic districts for rural regions or neighborhood cluster in Winnipeg. Zones are also ordered from best to worst for each indicator and districts within are ordered in the same way. You will notice the tables also include L's and H's for significant testing compared to Manitoba, but also here you, you will see um, wherever there's been uh, increase or decrease over time, there is a plus or minus. So in this example, you can see that Morris, uh, the community of Morris, had uh, premature death significantly increase over time. This level of detail has really come in handy for us working in the regions and I have to say this has been so helpful and I'm so appreciative that I could pick up any report across any community health assessment report and quickly see at a glance this difference. So you can see in this example from zone 4 to zone 1 it's in that specific order. So in zone 4 this would show the best rates and then all the way on the other end is zone 1 where we would see the worst rates. And you can see within that then uh, the difference between a community such as Niverville Richaud and the rates of premature death at 1.91 compared to uh, 7 regions which is higher than the provincial average at 4.5. This next uh, slide uh, is basically just an illustration that we found was very, very helpful when, in trying to understand the difference between incidence and prevalence of rates. So incidence refers to the number of new cases. So in this analogy, the water being added to the tub, whereas prevalence refers, refers to the existing cases. So people living with the illness, disease or disorder, they would be the water in the tub. So the only way to change that prevalence or lower the water in the tub would be to remove some cases. And how that happens is this could mean that people with that disease, disorder or condition have either passed away, died or have recovered. Most of the CHA indicators uh, report on prevalence, but for a small number, we also focus on um, all on incidents as well, for example, such as diabetes and cancer. So this can be confusing, but I think this bathtub visual really illustrates this um, very easily. This next slide gives you an example of those disparity calculations that are new to the reports. You will find these illustrations sprinkled throughout all of the reports. And this was also, again, a huge collaborative effort. This top graphic shows how strong a particular indicator is to income quintime levels. This is a provincial comparison and it is done in two ways. The example here is for rural income quintiles, but we also have one for urban, which would be included in the, the Winnipeg and Prairie Mountain uh, health reports for Brandon. The higher the number, the more strongly you would see that indicator being related to income. In this case, rural residents of the lowest income area had 2.2 times higher rates of premature death than the highest income areas. The bottom graphic is for geographic disparities, which are specific to each uh, region in Manitoba. Here we are looking to see if the gap between the best and worst rates has either widened or, uh, or decreased over time. In this example, in the first time period, the highest district was 2.5 times higher than the lowest district. However, in the second time period, this was 2.4 times higher between the highest and lowest. So this suggests that the gap reduced slightly or improved over time. As I mentioned, you could find these illustrations throughout each of the CHA reports, and we find that this is an easier way to illustrate the health inequities in our province because this is really important and we really hope that the CHA reports can now move that conversation forward about health inequities. We feel like we're in a better place within our province in terms of understanding what equitable means and inequitable and access to services. We know that this is a very important um, topic and just as a graphic depicts, we need to move that conversation forward to the right a little bit and talk about those systemic uh, barriers.
So now we have the data to demonstrate this and really advance that health equity discussion for our population. Okay, now we're going to take a little bit of a trip around the province, a bit, a bit of a staycation, so bear with me. So one of the unique features of each report is uh, these sections called A Closer Look, which are also lovingly referred to as story boxes. We wanted to give you just a brief experience on how these look and how they're used in the reports. And we picked just one example from each region. So let's first take a look at Winnipeg. To tell the story of health and well-being of any community or population in the 2019 uh, WRHA report, uh, they provided a closer look at health inequities, which will provide additional regional context. Here's why. We know that social determinants of health affect a person's health. This heat map uh, illustrates this perfectly. The distribution of median in household income in the disseminations within the Winnipeg Health Region based on the 2016 uh, Canadian Census. As you can see, people living in the central areas, which is that darker color, have a lower median household income after tax compared to people living in the rest of the uh, city. Income in uh, inequality also impacts health outcomes. So looking at that graphic to the right there and using lower limb amputation as an example, you can see that residents living in the lowest income areas were 3.5 times more likely to have an amputation due to diabetes than their peers living in the highest income areas in the second time period. And as you can see, this income disparity has widened over time. As well, in the Winnipeg region, both male and female life expectant expectancy increased significantly between time periods. Female life expectancy increased by 0.7 to 83.4 years, while male life expectancy increased by 1.1 to 79.4 years. So even though overall life expectancy improved in the region, huge disparities exist between community areas. The shortest was for residents living in Point Douglas, and the longest was for residents living in Inkster West. This was an 18-year difference, which is considerable. And we know that life expectancy is associated with socioeconomic status. And looking closely in the Inkster West area, so that is the area that had um, higher life expectancy, the median income uh, based on the census is at the top five highest income among all 25 neighborhood clusters in the Winnipeg region. In addition, around 50% of the residents are newcomers. Healthy immigrants effect is what we're thinking. So immigrants health or mortality is generally better than the rest of the Canadian born, although this tends to de decrease over time uh, for their years in Canada. It might be another factor contributing to the higher life expectancy. So this just zooms out on that, that story box. And um, as you can see, the the Winnipeg Health Region is working in partnership with multiple sectors to understand and address um, social determinants of health and amplify health equity actions. There is much more information uh, in the report. I'm not, I'm just going to highlight uh, one here. So the WRHA is a funder and partner of End Homelessness Winnipeg. Uh, since 2015, End Homelessness Winnipeg has served as the backbone organization and led to the implementation of a 10-year plan to end homelessness. In 2019, this has transitioned to become the Indigenous organization and launched now a five-year plan. So these are just examples of what you will find in a closer look. Then in southern Manitoba, let's take a closer look into immunizations. So now more than ever before, this has become an important public health intervention. Not only does it protect the health of a population, we know there is also huge cost saving benefit to the healthcare system. We really wanted to highlight this and send a strong message about uh, immunization, especially to the residents of Southern Manitoba. You may ask, 
Well, it's reasons such as this uh, data table that you will see before you. This is a new indicator, and it looks at the percentage of youth age 17 who re re uh, received the recommended doses of various childhood uh, vaccinations. Southern Health, unfortunately, has the lowest rates in the province for diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, and HPV. And we are now seeing this low vaccination coverage leading to outbreaks of diseases in a variety of communities. As shown in the CBC article from 2017, we had an outbreak of whooping cough, and this was a result of infants who were not being vaccinated that can have uh, implications, particularly for younger babies or people with weakened immune systems. And where we were seeing this outbreak first pop up was in Morden Winkler, but then in Steinbach. Now let's look at our CHA data. This looks at pertussis or whooping cough immunization within the region from 2015 to 2017. So this top graph here shows that uh, reduction in vaccination coverage rates starting in 2016. So that is a little bit concerning. However, the data can then be broken down in those into those four geographic zones. And you can see for zone four and for zone three that the rates were among the lowest in the region. This also correlates because these are also the communities where Steinbeck and, and Morden Winkler you would find. So back to our closer look box. This just zooms out so you can see the full page. And what we tried to do within that closer look <coughs> was highlight the importance of vaccinations. And we used an example from within our region. In this, we used mumps because this was not something we had seen uh, before, seen in Manitoba for many years. But also back in 2016, not only was there whooping cough, but there was also a big spike of mumps. Typically where we would see a handful of cases in Manitoba, suddenly there was hundreds. And this was not something we haven't seen in, in for 20 or 30 years. We had many cases in, Manito in southern Manitoba at this time too, and we tried to use this as an opportunity to commend the work that was done in the region because this was a tremendous effort among sa uh, staff and it really showed the success of following the mumps protocol because what, what happened was that it really helped to reduce the outbreak and it showcased how these things can really work. Now let's travel to the Northern Health region and they provided a closer look into their award-winning process for delivering speech language therapy using telehealth. So back in 2013, Northern Health Region, together with Hello SpeechWorks, received the Manitoba Patient Access Net Network Innovation Award in recognition of a partnership which has re resulted in more than 4,000 hours of speech language and swallowing therapy being delivered on camera to adults living in the North. Here it tells a story about P Patty Mason's experience with this service. He suffered a stroke in 2014 and wasn't able to swallow safely or communicate. He was treated on camera and says speech therapy has really been helpful and people can understand him now. He also speaks to how this service helped to reduce the isolation effects of communication disorders post-stroke. During some of Patty's sessions from the PAW telehealth site, he was able to communicate with his son Jordan and was very excited about the possibility of seeing his granddaughter on camera. Patty also participates in bi-weekly group therapy on camera from Norway House to Winnipeg and considers people in this group to be his friends. Let's take a look at the data. So this data on Northern Health Region stroke rates underscores the need for services to address strokes. Here you can see the age and sex adjusted average annual rate of death for or hospitalization for stroke per thousand residents over the age of 40. And the message is clear. Stroke rates for all other regions are clustered over to the right end while Northern Health Region rates are to the extreme right end and significantly higher than the provincial average. Not only that, but the Northern Health Region stroke rate is on the rise. There were 357 hospitalization or deaths due to stroke in the Northern Health Region in the most recent time period recorded. This is that uh, geographic disparity ratio illustration and for the northern health regions it is a large one. We know that the region is large covering from the top of our province, uh, the majority of the top of our province. 
Does this data suggest the same need for post-stroke services right across that region? And the answer is a resounding no. The stroke levels by zone are very similar to the rest of the province where for zone one. However, in zone three, levels are the other extreme and over four times as high as zone one. The di district disparity ratio data really brings that message home. The Northern Health District of Puckatawagan and Matthias Colomb had the highest stroke rate of 15.3 compared to the district of Flin Flon, Sheridan and Cranberry Portage with the lowest stroke rate of 2.0. Not only is this a huge gap in rates, but the gap is increasing. There was a disparity increase of 2.8 times over the two time periods. So clearly interventions such as Hello Speak Works are important and data such as this can help target the service to where it is needed most. Not only does this protect the health of our population, but it is also innovative and is a cost saver for the citizens of Manitoba. and now in Interlake Eastern Regional Health Authority. This focuses on the, they focused on uh, one of their story boxes for, focused on the residents experience with, um, from a survey with primary health care in the region. They conducted a survey with all 16 regional primary health uh, clinics in the fall of 2018 to get a better understanding of patient experience in the areas of access and wait times, team collaboration, visit, quality and experience, and dignity and respect. So data from the Community Health Survey, Canadian for, for from 2015 to 16, reflects that the percentage of regional responses that rated coordination between healthcare providers uh, as excellent or very good. As you can see, Interlake Eastern's Fuchsia Line forms a bookend on the right side of this scale. Although not statistically significant, Interlake Eastern has the highest rate of positive coordination between providers across the entire province at a rate of 50.5. This next graph tells a similar story. The majority of care data that is presented, which measures a percentage of residents with more than 50% of their visitors from the same physicians. Interlake Eastern rates are shown again in Fuchsia, and you can clearly see that they have increased over time from the first time period. This is a good news story showing that three out of four Interlake Eastern residents received the majority of their care from the same provider over a two time year period. And this survey, information from surveys such as this also helps because Interlake Eastern is an excellent uh, example on how to do this uh, for, for many surveys that they have run in their regions. And here they had an excellent response rate of uh, 86% uh, from all of the surveys with over 682 completed surveys. The survey scores on access and wait times and team collaboration are very high at 93 and 92% respectively. Response rates are still positive, but not quite as high for rating the amount of time for that a healthcare provider spent with patients and rating whether the healthcare provider involves a patient in decisions. But this looks like a good news story for the rest of the province that we could be looking at for Interlake Eastern to show the way to um, in, involve uh, uh, the voice of the customer. In our final example, we are going to Prairie Mountain Health Region. Let's take a closer look, where they did a closer look into sedative deprescribing for community seniors, and this is around benzodiazepines. As you can see from this graph, the rates are really high for Prairie Mountain Health. <clears throat> this graph looks at residents who are living within the community that were overprescribed for benzodiazepines. Uh, Prairie Mountain has the highest rate in the province, and is, as you can see, is almost twice as high compared to Northern. But the other thing you can note is that drop over time, which is a really good uh, progress. Still the highest rate in the province, there was a significant decrease from 24% to 22 This next graph is even more impressive because it looks at that same indicator of benzodiazepine overprescribing, but for residents living in per personal care home. 
And look at that difference. What a difference in time from 46% to 32%. And this is not just by random luck, but rather a huge regional effort that has made this happen. And the closer look story box really gets into more details because there was um, a MIPS award back in 2018 that was given to Prairie Mountain Health for the interdisciplinary team that was established uh, that put together a pilot project, which actually engaged uh, not only physicians and nurse practitioners, but also pharmacists. Working together, this is an excellent example of how data can not only drive quality improvement efforts, but can, it can also be a reward when you see rates like this drop. I'm just going to take a moment to read that last paragraph within this closer look to give you a sense on, on how this works. So in acute care settings, pharmacy services have developed a process to identify clients for whom a sedative was initiated in hospital. Where appropriate, sedative use is discontinued at the time of discharge and information provided regarding non-pharmaceutical alternatives. It is anticipated that this will reduce the number of community dwelling seniors with inappropriate benzodiazepine use. So bravo Prairie Mountain Health for this great effort. We're nearing the end of our presentation, but I'm just going to uh, give you now a bird's eye view of the provincial picture and what the data says that makes Manitoba unique. So first of all, Manitoba's population is growing and growing. This is based on population projections looking at the medium forecast of birth, death and immigration, which are three main factors of population growth in Manitoba. And what we know is that currently our population is at 1.3 million, but this is expected to increase to 1.6 million by 2030. And this will not be the same that we don't expect it to be the same um, for all regions because there is some variation within. We are expecting to see the highest increases around Winnipeg and Southern, which have are expecting to increase by 20% or more. So Winnipeg is expected to get to about 1 million and Southern to 250,000 by 2030. Something else that's unique uh, is that 44% of Manitoba's population is rural and is distributed across geographies with less than 10 people per kilometer. Like many jurisdictions uh, in Canada and all over the world, Manitoba's population is aging, but we also have a young population. The largest growth is projected to occur in the older demographics from 60 to 70 years and 80 years and older cohorts, also known as the baby boomers. However, Manitoba remains the only province where youth under the age of 15 exceed the older adult population. Manitoba's Indigenous population makes up 18% of our overall population, representing over 220,000 residents. This is the highest of any province in Canada. As you can see in the table, there is regional variation, with the highest proportion living in Northern Health Region and Interlake Eastern. And finally, we wouldn't have Folklorama if we didn't have a diverse population with a cultural mosaic representing all over the world. This is something that we know we are very proud of. And we worked very closely with the Provincial Managerial Roundtable, Santé en Français, to determine the best indicator to capture the number of Francophones living in Manitoba. They recommended a, a question from the census about knowledge of official languages. And based on this information, it is estimated that we have 8.7% of Manitoba's population as French speaking, which represents over 108,000 residents. The CHA also shows that 19.2% of Manitoba residents would have immigrant status, which represents 225 residents. The majority of the immigrants have settled again around Winnipeg and southern Manitoba, and the top five countries by place of birth are Philippines, followed by India, United Kingdom, Germany, and China. And Philippines uh, represents almost half of all the immigrants. Manitoba has a legislative requirement for healthcare organizations to be accredited and the evidence of use of community health assessment fulfills those standard requirements. 
The importance of CHA was also highlighted in a recent commissioning and accountability workshop. In fact, the first seven of the seven step um, cycle, commissioning cycle um, was identifying the provincial, regional and system level met and unmet health needs to enable health and healthcare systems make informed decisions about strategies, priorities and resource uh, utilization. To me, that sounds like a lot of the information we can pull from community health assessments. Many grant funding applications um, also have inc included requirements to demonstrate relationship with broad stakeholder groups and access to population health data. So uh, CHA reports can be very um, useful in fulfilling those requirements. Lastly, we wanted to show you that acts the that access and potential use of CHA data has been vastly improved through the development of the CHA data por uh, portal. This is really exciting for us in our province and is a suite of online data tools and links intended to supplement the PDF versions of the 2019 CHA reports published by each of the regional health authorities. This is now accessible in the link uh, provided on the presentation above, so we encourage you to check it out. So what's next, uh, you may ask, for CHA in Manitoba? The coordination of CHAN and its processes and working groups has been done by the department and the question that has been raised about the appropriateness of this continuing within the current uh, PPFO focus of the department. So until a permanent home and direction is determined, the George and Fayey Center for Healthcare Innovation, or CHI, has offered to provide a communication link and keep the CHA network connected. The CHI has also indicated an interest in lining with the CHA and possibly taking a larger coordinating role. So in this time of transition, it has become clear that anything is possible and we can do anything. And it is our wish that the role of CHA Manitoba will continue and continually involve to meet the evolving needs and priorities and inform the improvements to the health of all Manitobans. I will leave you with this last slide and a link to all of the CHA reports on the shared health uh, uh, site where you can find access to them. Thank you very much.